Good morning, everyone. I'm Lisa Lawson, Membership Services Coordinator for the Ohio Fire Chiefs Association. Thank you for joining us for this morning's Flooded Roadway Laws webinar presented by Chief Mike Weatherby of the Wellington Community Fire District. If you have any questions throughout this webinar, uh, we will answer them at the end. You can either raise your hand or put your questions into the question bar. And now I'm going to turn it over to Chief Weatherby. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, this is Chief Weatherby, Fire Chief of the Wellington Fire District. This past summer, the Chief's Conference, I presented a, a class based on uh, Senate Bill 106, the flooded roadway law. Uh, we had a few attendees, um, but in our, our uh, course of going through that, I talked with Chief Joe Kitchen and uh, ultimately Michelle uh, Fitzgibbon, and we felt that a webinar would be a good way to reach out to uh, quite a few people. Uh, so we scheduled that and, and here we are. Um, I'd like to make it uh, known right from the start that I am no legal expert on this. I just, uh, I happen to have a, a vested um, stake in, in this law uh, due to uh, an unfortunate incident we had about 12 years ago. So what I'd like to do today is um, achieve the following ob objectives, uh, basically just to help create an awareness of the understanding, um, an awareness and understanding of the law, review the required signage. There are a few caveats in the, the law that uh, has to be followed in order for the um, restitution to be made. And then uh, the reaction of the Lorain County agencies that I dealt with um, law enforcement and the uh, ODOT, uh, the county engineer's office, uh, et cetera. A little bit about my fire district. We're located in the southern portion of Lorain County. Uh, I cover one village and five townships, approximately 125 square miles, 13,000 residents. We do run a combination department, myself and one assistant chief, our full-time uh, career personnel. And right now I'm up to 30 paid per call employees. We do run fire rescue and emergency medical response. We do not run transport EMS. Uh, we average about 505 runs a year. The reason I'm, I have uh, such a, an investment in this is uh, June 22nd, 2006, we lost one of our divers in a swift water accident. Um, Alan H. Anderson Jr., we, we all knew him as Buzz, uh, lost his life while trying to rescue two stranded teenagers in a, uh, a rather severe swift water incident. And part of my presentation, I'm just going to go quickly through um, the um, events preceding and, and uh, the events during the incident. And then we'll get into the uh, the law uh, itself and, and discuss that. The evening prior to our incident, uh, most of our personnel were out all night. Uh, we were fighting a, a, a structure fire due to a lightning strike and we experienced heavy rainfall the entire previous day. Overnight, it was a moderate to heavy rain, steady. Um, five inches plus and it left the area saturated and uh, a lot of uh, runoff. Uh, there are numerous roads in our district were unpassable. Uh, we had uh, a lot of calls uh, the, the morning of the incident actually. Uh, the water was swift moving and you could actually, uh, you know, it was visibly rising. On the day of the incident, the rains did diminish in the morning and it got uh, sunny and uh, extremely humid. Uh, there were several areas in the district were underwater, more, more so than usual. We had uh, had experienced flooding in many areas where we never did before. Uh, the water was rapidly and, and visibly rising. The, the duration of the incident, uh, the couple hours that we were out there, the water rose nearly 10 inches in uh, the short time we were out there. Um, we and like I say that we had several water incidents after daylight. People trying to get to work, uh, driving into the water. Uh, we escorted a lot of people 
out of water that morning. Uh, the river, the Black River, the West Branch, uh, where, where this happened uh, out on Pitts Road in Peck Wadsworth in Wellington Township, um, went from um, went really from normal uh, through past action and into the uh, flood stage very quickly. Uh, some notes about the incident. It occurred at uh, 1318 hours, um, just shortly after 1, 1 p.m. We got a call for two juveniles stranded in flood waters. It was a result of them ignoring road closed barricades. There were barricades placed um, to uh, uh, alert traffic not to, to go through the water. Their vehicle stalled. It was a uh, uh, four-wheel drive uh, Jeep Cherokee and um, they got into the water. They were washed off the road and, and the vehicle stalled. They exited the vehicle and he tried uh, carrying his passenger out of the water and they were both swept into uh, trees at the river's edge and two strainers. They were able to catch and uh, cling to uh, trees and uh, start hollering for, for help. They were approximately uh, between 100 and 150 yards from the closest reachable point. On our way out there, we had to detour considerable times and, and distances to reach the scene. Uh, so it took us a, a little more time to get out there. I think I think that added to the, the frustration of the incident itself. Um, we made a first attempt uh, from the south shore, which was unsuccessful. Um, Buzz was uh, washed into the strainers, was able to get out. Um, at that time, our, our chief ordered all operations to move to the North Shore. So we, we packed up, we took everything to the North Shore. Um, the boat arrived and boat bay stops began as well. And with the first attempt failing, uh, we regrouped and we started second rescue attempts. Um, Wellington is known very well for diving and we've, we've had a very strong dive team for many years. And, uh, our divers have trans, you know, kind of transgressed into the swift water um, rescue uh, mode, and uh, I think uh, really the we we got caught up in in the moment. We had two teenagers out there, and uh, you know, in hindsight, uh, we did a lot of things probably that we shouldn't have done, and we've learned a lot of lessons ultimately. Um, learning them the hard way, um, losing one of our personnel in the, in the process. Some of the incident notes. Um, when Anderson was going in for a second attempt, he explained what his plan was. It seemed to be a fairly decent plan. We trusted Alan and, and his judgment. Uh, he entered water. He was doing well. The boat was also beginning their second attempt. So we had two separate operations going on, which probably wasn't the best thing. Um, just before Alan reached the teens, he started to signal that he, he was in distress and we began moving him slowly. At first, he was able to help uh, with self-rescue efforts. Uh, when we noticed that he uh, was no longer able to uh, help himself, that's when we uh, removed him immediately and began resuscitation efforts. He was life flighted to Cleveland, pronounced dead a short time later. Um, not something we had planned on happening that day. Uh, like I said, I think we were we were overwhelmed by the situation. We let uh, we let emotions take over, and uh, you know our judgment was uh, I would say our judgment was was compromised by that. Um, we, like I said, we were more of a diving type department than swift water. And I feel that got us into trouble also. There was uh, a lot to be learned after after that. And, and we, we concentrated on training. Uh, we had very good rapport with Alan's family and we, we stood by his family and uh, they stood by us. They backed us through some bad times when we were ridiculed and criticized uh, severely 
uh, we had the, the, the backing of, of Buzz's family, which uh, that meant a lot to us. But we made it through, and basically that's why I'm sitting here today going through this. Is We, we have a, uh, a major stake in, in this. This is a picture of Buzz on the second attempt. This was made from the south shore. Uh, you see the vehicle there, and then you see the point. Uh, this was made from the north shore. You see the point uh, furthest uh, on the south shore. That's where actually where the river is. That was the bridge. So we were, that river was spilled almost 600 feet wide out of its banks. So it was, uh, it was quite a scene. Notes from the ODNR report, the, the river calculations at the closest recordable area, which is uh, Illyria, going up into uh, and, and going through Illyria, at Wednesday night, 12 a.m., the depth was 1.29 feet at a flow rate of 0 0.078 um, thousand cubic feet per, per second. Thursday at the time of call, the depth had rose to 7.15 square feet at 2.44 thousand cubic feet per second. The river ultimately crested the next day at 16.86 feet, the ninth highest um, in, in history, you know, in recorded history. So it was, uh, it was uh, a, a phenomenon basically we it's never been that high since um, a few more comments from the uh, uh, investigator natural terrain features um, left no room for error without placing rescuers and, and further hazards um, an already dangerous site taken to extreme uh, victims or rescuers that would be swept through the initial strainers uh, that the kids were holding on to would have little or no chance of they would have gone uh, into the river at that point and um, th there would have been no chance to recover at, at that point. Uh, so we, we were in a situation, uh, I think, that we had never been in um, in previous rescues. Most of them were, you know, walking in with a boat and escorting people out, getting people, um, you know, out of their vehicles, but uh, nothing to this extreme. Partly as a result of this, um, I've been included in, and asked to uh, work with um, Senate Bill 106. Uh, it was introduced by Tim Schaefer uh, from Lancaster. It was endorsed by the Ohio Fire Chiefs and the Ohio Emergency Management Association. And I, I have to thank Michelle Fitzgibbon. She's uh, ultimately responsible for me being here, uh, she she reached out and asked me if I would uh, participate and, and give testimony um, explaining what happened to us, and I was happy to do so. Okay, my role included uh, providing testimony before the Senate Transportation Committee uh, back in 2013. And then uh, again, before the House Transportation, Public Safety and Homeland Security in uh, 2014. And then um, at uh, Michelle's suggestion, we petitioned to rename the bill after Alan Anderson Jr. And that's how the, uh, the bill actually got its name. And uh, again, a big thanks to Michelle there. And I was able to escort Alan's parents, Alan Kathy, down to Columbus to meet with Governor Kasich and be present for signing of the bill. And that meant uh, that meant a lot to Alan Kathy and really a culmination to everything that they had been through to see that that, um, you know, their son didn't die for for nothing. There was um, lessons learned and actions taken as a result of, uh, you know, losing their son. And that's uh, the signing of the bill and Al and Kathy find uh, Governor Kasich. Okay, getting into the law, um, Ohio Revised Code, it's uh, 4511.714. 
and known as the Flooded Roadway Law or the Allen H. Anderson Jr. Act. It became effective March 25th, 2015. So that's how old this is. And we're just now starting to talk about it because it, it doesn't happen a great deal. Since we lost Buzz, we we have not even done a handful of rescues. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping people are getting the um, the message not to go through high water, but uh, it's not something we, we do a lot. It's kind of a, um, in our area, it's, it's low frequency, high risk type um, rescues. The law comes in, in three, three parts, basically three paragraphs, and I'll go through each paragraph. Um, I usually don't read totally from PowerPoints, but I will, I will read these. Um, no person shall operate a vehicle onto a public street or highway that is temporarily closed by a rise in water level, including groundwater or an overflow of water that is clearly marked by a sign that specifies the road is closed due to a rise in water level and that any person who uses the closed portion of the road may be fined up to $2,000. Okay, I, I highlighted a couple areas there, clearly marked by a sign. Like I said, the law comes with uh, with provisions and you have to have the proper signage and we're going to cover that uh, otherwise the citation cannot be written and enforced it can only be written as a, uh, a minor misdemeanor and uh, fined through the courts there is no there's, there's no grounds for any type of restitution and then fined up to two thousand dollars all that has to be on the sign for uh, for this law to uh, be used. Okay, part B, a person who has issued a citation for a violation of Division A of this section is not permitted to enter a written plea of guilty. They cannot waive the, their, the, the ticket and pay it. They have to appear in court and uh, the proper appear in court to uh, answer the charge. Okay, they're not allowed to waive the ticket. They have to appear before the judge. Okay, and then see whoever violates Division A of this section is guilty of a minor misdemeanor. In addition to the financial sanctions authorized or required under Section 2929.28, and we'll cover some of this as well of the revised code and to any cost otherwise authorized or required under the provision of law the court imposing a sentence upon an offender who is convicted of or pleads guilty to a violation of division a of this section shall order the offender to reimburse one or more rescuers for the cost any such rescuer incurred in rescuing the person excluding the cost of transporting the rescued person to a hospital or other facility for treatment of injuries up to a cumulative maximum of two thousand dollars if more than one rescuer was involved in an emergency response the court shall allocate the reimbursement uh, reimbursement proportionately according to the cost each rescuer incurred a financial sanction imposed under this section is a judgment in favor of the rescuer and subject to a determination of indigency under Division B of Section 2929.28 of the Revised Code. A rescuer may collect a financial sanction in the same manner as provided in Section 2929.28 of the Revised Code. Okay, and we'll go through and, and explain what a lot of that stuff means. And then finally, uh, as used in this section, uh, emergency medical service organization, firefighting agency, and private fire company have the same meanings. Um, you have to basically um, 
be considered one of those under 9.60 of the revised code. And rescuer means a state agency, political subdivision, firefighting agency, private fire company, or emergency medical service organization. So this just isn't for the fire and rescue departments. Uh, if you have um, private ambulances, they are, um, uh, they, they could probably go after restitution uh, if you're uh, law enforcement, you know, state patrol, sheriff, local law enforcement, they could probably uh, go after this restitution as well. So it's kind of for anybody involved in the rescue of, of the, the uh, accused. Okay, to touch a little bit on 2929.28, uh, financial sanctions, it explains the financial sanctions basically if you go to that portion of the uh, revised code um, and restitution process in addition to court costs and fines. Okay, also in that, unless this position can be made through Rule 13, which it can't, what well, Rule 13 requires is a uh, the, the establishment and operation of a traffic violations bureau basically a a clerk of courts you where you would go to waive uh, so it specifies in there again that you cannot waive um, and and just go and pay it you have to appear um, also restitution shall be made to the victim considered the, the rescuers um, to the adult probation department or to the clerk of court on behalf of the, the victim or, or rescuers known as the rescuers. Continuing at 2929.28, the judge can order restitution based on the amount recommended by the rescuer or the amount recommended by the offender. If the offender says, I, I'll agree to pay this much, the judge may say, okay, that's fine. You know, we're gonna tack that on and and that's going to be considered restitution to the to your rescuers on top of your $120 fine for a fourth degree uh, misdemeanor. It can be ordered based on a pre-sentence investigation report, uh, estimates or receipts for repairs or replacement of uh, you know lost or, or, or damaged equipment, uh, any other information that's offered. And the cost recovery data, uh, I would tend to say we should stick with, you know, in my department, we're sticking with FEMA rates for equipment. If, if you have engines, rescue trucks, whatever you have out there, um, try to stay close to the FEMA rates, uh, the salaries of your personnel, and it must be justifiable. It cannot exceed, um, you know, uh, a large amount of cost. You, you can't add cost or just throw something out there uh, for punitive purposes. It, it, it is basically to recoup uh, to recoup your cost. The court can hold a hearing uh, to determine if the defendant is able to pay restitution. If they determine uh, that there is a, a case of uh, indigency that they they are not going to pay or not going to be able to pay, they can order community service under 2929.27 uh, section A. So it's you know if you can't get the money, they're they're going to order community service in in most cases. So there's a, like I said, along with the law comes a lot of other um, um, caveats. Okay, we'll get uh, we'll get into the signage part here. Uh, the signage for the law, and it's specified right in there. It's called out in the Ohio Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. Uh, the code number for the the proper sign is R11 H4 A. Um, I'll show you a, a, an example of that. It's a type three barricade, it's five foot tall, four foot minimum width, and it's got eight to 12 inch rails with four, basically four inch stripes or chevrons um, if, you know, on 45 degree angles. 
So it is, uh, it's rather easy to see. Um, and again, these requirements are specific to Ohio Revised Code 4511.714. These signs must be in place if the citation is written. Okay, the law enforcement, if, if that proper sign is not used, the, the law can't be enforced. Uh, there's an example of the sign, road closed, high water, max fine, $2,000. And the sign is attached to the, uh, the proper barricade. That's the page out of the, um, the manual that gets uh, uh, published and, and sent out to uh, ODOT and uh, county engineers. And it's got all the dimensions for the, the lettering, numbering, uh, sign height, width, everything is on there. Additional signage we see quite often, and, and I just threw this in here, a lot of places in our district, we have depth gauge markers uh, where you can stand and see what the, the uh, depth of the water is. And then just kind of high water warning signs uh, to alert drivers that they're, they're approaching an area of high water. Okay, so that's the signage. And, and again, the signage is, is very important. And what we did with uh, our fire district is the firefighters association, they donated money and had signs made and give to each of the townships uh, based on how many areas that they have that needs to be closed on a regular basis. So we, we actually give the proper signs to our townships to make sure that they would be used, the, that the proper signs would be out there and, and be used. Um, the biggest thing with the law is education and awareness, okay? Making sure your jurisdiction is on board, uh, is the public aware of the law, other agencies, your law enforcement, uh, your county engineer, township uh, roadman and, and trustees, um, fire departments, legal systems, uh, do they know about the law? And are they, they prepared and willing to and force the law, okay? And starting with the public, get the word out, you know, go uh, put out press releases, uh, utilize department literature, get things, um, you know, uh, out there in print, talks, lectures, uh, newsletters, and urge the other agencies to do the same. Make the public aware that uh, no longer is it gonna be a slap on the wrist to, to enter high water and have to be rescued. It's gonna be, uh, it's gonna hurt them financially to do that. And going through our agencies here, I've, I've talked to all the agencies in Lorain County and, and asked them how they receive uh, updates when laws have changed. And uh, I was surprised that many agencies in Lorain County, even in, in 2018, still are unsure and, and not in full understanding of what the law actually is uh, in the signage. Um, a lot of the law enforcement were not um, aware of, of the, the, the change in the law, basically. Um, how do they receive the, the, the booklets, the county engineer? They usually get the, the, uh, the manual and they have to go through and they'll check the revisions and, and see. Uh, Lorraine County, I must say, did a very good job. Uh, those were Lorraine County signs that uh, that I showed you the picture of. So they are using the correct sign, and they are getting out there, getting out there early, and getting barricades placed where they need to get them placed in times of uh, high water. Um, so I, I really have to commend Lorraine County. They know uh, when the signs are are to be placed and when. Um, where the signs are to be placed and, and they seem to have an adequate supply of, of the proper signage. Ohio Department of Transportation generally changes in laws and changes to the, uh, the traffic control manual uh, are communicated from the central office down, down the line through the district and into the county level. And speaking with ODOT, 
in Lorain County, they were also somewhat aware of the law and they, they keep a pretty good eye on, on the signage. Um, much of it is made and sent to the county level to ex replace existed, uh, existing uh, signage. And a lot of times how they're uh, made aware of, of road blockages due to high water are by uh, OSP or general public is calling. Uh, a good example right now in, in my district, we have a flooded state highway and uh, they were they were right on top of it. Uh, ODOT or OSP had alerted them and I had you know people calling a fire station. Uh, so we were able to contact ODOT as well and they had already had a road closed at that point. Your townships, a lot of your information is passed uh, through the townships, through meetings, bulletins. Uh, they have township association meetings and, and um, you know, newsletters. That's where uh, uh, the townships are, you know, learn a lot of the changes and in, in laws and if there's any, uh, you know, change in, in verbiage or revisions. They pretty much know the quantity of signs they need by past experience. They know where their roads flood. Um, so they know their trouble areas, and I, I know in Wellington's fire district, every township knows where to look first. You know which areas are going to flood first, second, third, um, and they they stay on top of it. They do a, a fine job. Uh, they're usually they're alerted by phone calls uh, from the public, safety services, etc. We put people out uh, driving township roads uh, to see where the water levels are at. And um, uh, like I said, again, they know pretty much where to go first uh, to get the signs placed. Fire and rescue, they usually learn about changes through presentations, lectures, um, a lot of times at your department, county, regional, and state levels. Uh, we try to get the word out with uh, instances and, and, and uh, situations such as this. Uh, I think we do a, a pretty good job communicating and, and getting passed around through the county and, and uh, regional and state levels. We work with all agencies in respective jurisdictions, uh, mutual aid agreements to enforce, and then we need to have a good system to pass restitution costs uh, quickly and, and, and efficiently. And that's that's one of the, the tough things is, is the police are asking, well, how how do we know what uh, what the costs are going to be, or what your costs are going to be, or you know, how will the judicial system know? Is a judge that's going to throw a monetary figure out there, or is he going to have something to go by? And that's why we we have to have a good system to pass on these costs quickly and efficiently, so it's it's not lost. Law enforcement. They uh, receive their changes through a lot of bulletins, legislative reviews, seminars, lectures, pretty much the same way the fire department does. Uh, some of your departments, they will have a person that is responsible for um, reviewing changes in the law. So they, they are up to, to date. Um, I, I just, I found it odd that uh, some of the law enforcement agencies in Lorain County weren't uh, weren't aware of the law until I approached them and, and sat down and talked with them. Um, another question I ask law enforcement, would the officers write the citation if all the conditions of, of the incident are met? Or will they just write uh, going around, or going around, a, or, uh, traveling on a uh, closed road? Um, most of the agencies seem to think that their officers would write uh, the citation. Officers may or may not take offense if asked by rescuers to write the citation. That was another question. If if I am on scene at an incident and I walk up to, um, for example, the um, highway patrolman that is doing the investigation and ask him, are you going to cite him according to um, flooded roadway law, uh, you know, 45, 11.714, uh, 
uh, am I going to get uh, am I going to get yelled at or or treated poorly? Um, I actually had a, a couple of police chiefs tell me that yeah, their officers may take offense to being asked if they're going to enforce the law accordingly. So that's that's something you you have to. Uh, I guess at that point, build a rapport and let them know, um, so it, it doesn't appear that you're you're telling them how to do their job. Uh, I had to, the um, luxury of talking with one of our our county prosecutors, and I I went through and I asked him the questions. And he answered uh, the questions that, that I was most concerned with, and that is, what's the judicial system going to do when faced with, um, you know, the, the first time this shows up in their courtroom? And and I asked them pretty much what I ask all the other agencies: How are the courts or judges made aware of changes regarding uh, the Ohio Revised Code and traffic laws that may require their ruling? And again, a lot of them are seminars, bulletins. Um, generally, if the case is based on a charge, they aren't familiar with, they'll look up the code section and go by the code. So that's um, that's another reason to get with your judicial systems and make sure that the, they're aware of this, that uh, you know, they start passing the word through. Would judges in Lorain County be inclined to rule in favor of restitution? If the defendant is properly cited and all the provisions of the law are met, and they seem to think yes, unless the um, indigency could be proven, uh, restitution must be substantiated. Uh, they, like I said, they're not going to let us just throw um, figures out of the air and 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 get paid for. We have to have justification for the reimbursement that we're asking for. Uh, costs can't be off the cuff or inflated for punitive reasons. Other than provisions in the law, is there any reason that judges would choose not to impose restitution? Again, ind indigency would, would most likely be the only reason. Uh, in that instance, the other option would be community service. The court may determine indigency right away, or it may be the result of non-payment of the order. They may feel that the the uh, accused or the convicted can pay and then after at, at that point they don't pay and won't pay refuse to pay um, you know that would be a, a reason that it would have to go further then uh, but the prosecutor has no reason to believe that uh, any judge would order community service over the financial restitution if the defendant's able to pay or choose to take no action at all other than just giving them the fine for the minor misdemeanor. If it's there, if the costs are there, if everything is is adequate and in order, um, he had no reason to think that the, the judge would make any other decision. Uh, in his opinion, uh, would the judges take offense if um, the agencies that are seeking restitution attended to court date? Uh, if they ask for a chance to uh, explain uh, what the restitution was for, he felt that the judges would be uh, greatly in favor and probably welcome the opportunity for uh, a fire chief or um, you know the uh, the patrolman to to go to court and speak on why why they're asking for what they're asking. Um, how would a judge know how much restitution is being requested? Or would the judge determine the amount? Um, that was another another thing that uh, that I was really concerned about with the judicial system. Um, the answer it would be received from the rescuing agency in an itemized worksheet and added to the law enforcement report. So it would go to the courts along with the citation and uh, the uh, port, uh, report from law enforcement. Okay, and then some other side notes uh, in talking with Mr. Carlson. Um, an order of restitution is similar to a, a civil judgment. If there's an order to pay and the defendant does not pay, it would most likely be followed up by legal counsel. Uh, they could pose possible liens against real estate, garnishment of wages, um, you know, those types of, of instances. 
regardless of all the judicial happenings, the prosecutor will see the case and a plea of not guilty goes to them or guilty, no contest. The prosecutor review, reviews everything and he will let the judge know that, hey, this is a case where uh, restitution is being requested and this is why, and this is, you know, it's under this code here. So we're, we're really, we're relying on our prosecutors as much as we're relying on the judges. Okay, talking with the prosecutor, I ask basically what is the best way to pass or forward restitution costs so the court gets them and understands them. Yeah, we went with a good, better, best uh, situation. And uh, the good is the citation cannot be waived, okay, under, um, under the law. They, they must appear so the prosecutor can request a sentencing hearing for a guilty or no contest plea. Uh, if a, a not guilty plea is given, the case would go to the prosecutor then. Okay, so that's that gives time for the prosecutor to get those restitution costs in his hand and, um, you know, make sure that everything is, is in order. A better situation would be ask law enforcement to delay the citation and assignment of the court date. Forward a copy of the restitution cost to law enforcement in a, in a timely manner so it can be turned into the court or turned into the prosecutor with the actual citation and report. And then the report um, can be served to the defendant all at once, you know, and the court date uh, established. That would require them to, you know, go go back out to the uh, the, the uh, defendant's house or something to issue the citation or to give the paperwork and assign the court date. Um, so that's kind of kind of cumbersome for your for your law enforcement. Uh, the best way he came up with, and we somewhat agreed, uh, is to have a formal worksheet with the vehicle equipment and manpower costs listed, have that in, in uh, uh, your apparatus in one of your uh, your notebooks or um, you know printable from, from your uh, MDT or something that, that you can give law enforcement right there on scene. Uh, complete the worksheet at the scene, give it to them at the time of the incident, and then there's no question. They've got it in their hands um, when they leave the scene and it can be forwarded with the citation and, and their report uh, to the courts. And what I did is, this is what I put together for our fire district and just has, you know, our local jurisdiction information, um, date and time of the incident, the driver information, and then I, I listed up to, I, I believe, 10 resources and then I put our resources with the cost. If we have, for example, if we have a ladder truck out there, we're gonna charge or ask for $100 an hour. Engines, $90. And again, these are based on FEMA rates or very close to FEMA rates. Um, you know, on down the line there, wages, uh, you know, $15 an hour for the firefighters, uh, myself, my assistant chief wages, whatever. All that is there, all that can be filled out, signed, dated, and given to law enforcement right there on scene. So there's no question at that point. That's a memorial that was made for Buzz by his coworkers. And uh, that is at the scene where, where he lost his life. And I thought it was interesting, I threw in here, the uh, International Association of Dive Rescue Specialists report that three to four public safety personnel die each year by drowning. So that might be just divers, that could be divers and or swift water, but um, you know, we do uh, we do lose you know a few people every year on average. I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to do this webinar. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have, and you can uh, get my contact information here. You can um, 
you can ask uh, any questions that you have uh, here or you can feel free to contact me, call me, email me. Um, you know, I'll send you anything that I have or try to answer anything I have. Uh, again, let me state that I am no legal expert. I am learning this as I go. And uh, you know, luckily we have not had to test this law and that's, um, you know, that's, that's a good thing on our part. And if other jurisdictions are in situations where they have to test the law, I'd be interested in finding out how things went, you know, through the, uh, through the legal and, and, and the court system, um, how, how, how did it work out for you guys? So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you.